So let's welcome our guests. The topic today is resting in resilience, preserving African-American burial grounds amidst challenges. We're gonna have Dr. Rhonda Thomas from Clinton University, Tom Chapman with the Albemarle Charlottesville Historical Society, Miss Diane Brown Towns, who is a descendant coming out of Albemarle County, Virginia, Lorenzo Dickinson with Maupin Town Media, AKA Descendant, and then Grant Michaud, Research Assistant at the International African American Museum Center for Family History. And my name is Shelly Murphy, and I'll be moderating today. So I am going to stop sharing my screen and go ahead and again welcome everyone we're going to do a little introductions first and then we'll start talking about the current projects and things that people are involved in so grant you are up in my left hand corner so will you introduce yourself and um tell what project you'll talk about later uh, yes, ma'am. Um, my name is Grant Michaud. I am born and raised in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. I'm a 13th generation Charlestonian. My family came to Charleston in 1687, and I'm retired from the fire department originally, but I've been doing genealogy for a little over 30 years, and um, I really got um, involved in why the black cemeteries were not getting the the proper recognition that the other ones were. And um, so I started look, researching old cemeteries and one thing led to another, then a database, and then, you know, the rest is history. Um, and I'm currently a full-time research assistant and a genealogist at the Center for Family History at International African American Museum. All right. Thank you, Dr. Rhonda Thomas. Um, good afternoon. Uh, I am a Calvin Lemon Professor of Literature at Clemson University. And there I also am the coordinator of research and community engagement for our Woodland Cemetery and African-American Burial Ground project. Uh, I also have a, my own project called Call My Name, which documents the history of Black people uh, at Clemson from the Fort Hill Plantation owned by John C. Calhoun uh, era. Clemson is built on his plantation uh, into the 21st century. Um, I am a sixth generation South Carolinian, uh, so I am also very involved in documenting my own family history. So hopefully today I can talk about uh, another cemetery project that just came uh, to my attention that involves um, my family members who are buried in cemeteries and black cemeteries in the KC, South Carolina area. Glad to be here. Thank you. Miss Brown Towns. Hello, I'm Diane Brown Towns, and as Dr. Shelley said, I, I, I live in Elmore County, Virginia, and uh, my family and Lorenzo's family, we've, we've been able to trace our family back to 1765 at Cal Castle Hill. We're here to talk about Penn Park going forward, and I uh, would like to do a little comparative study on another cemetery that's going through the same thing that Penn Park Cemetery is going through. We are talking about uh, ground penetrating radar and doing, um, hopefully we can adopt um, this site as a sister site so that we can better study Penn Park. Um, I, phase one of the work that I do, more concentrated for the last seven years, is studying historic landmarks and public spaces, contextualizing them, and phase two, I'm connecting communities through those studies so that we can um, look at a more accurate picture of uh, community memory or cultural memory. Got it. Thank you for that. Uh, Lorenzo and Tom, I'll have you come in on the end here. Lorenzo Dickerson. Hi, I'm Lorenzo Dickerson. I'm a documentary filmmaker. I'm located in Albemarle County. Uh, my work focuses on stories of African-American history and culture. I uh, do a lot of work with uh, PBS and uh, VPM, which is PBS in Virginia and other organizations. And uh, my family history uh, is that we're uh, from Albemarle County for generations and uh, a descendant of the uh, enslaved at places like Penn Park, the University of Virginia, and uh, Castle Hill. Thank you for that. 
And Tom, and I put you on the end here pretty much because you'll kick off the first question after you introduce yourself. I think you're on mute. Sorry. Gotcha. Um, yeah, I thought I'd share my screen also, and uh, Lorenzo and Diane can uh, take a look at some of the images. If they want me to pull them up back again. Uh, my name's Tom Chapman. I'm the executive director with the Albemarle Charlottesville Historical Society. Uh, been in that position since uh, April of 2020. Um, before that, um, I worked at uh, James Madison's Montpelier in Orange County, Virginia, and uh, was very involved with the uh, Madison family um, genealogy as it related to cemetery research there, and then also uh, very early research into the enslaved uh, community cemetery at Montpelier. So when uh, I got involved in uh, Charlottesville and began to look around and understand more about what was going on in the area, um, I met up with Jeff Werner, who is a city, um, the city of Charlottesville historic preservation planner, in 2019, he started to um, look at the history of Penn Park and some uh, unmarked uh, burials that uh, he had seen there. This was history that goes back a while. There was an understanding that there were burials there, but they conducted a, a ground penetrating radar survey. You can see on the right hand side the different colored spots that show where unmarked burials um, were located. Some have depressions, some don't. Um, they didn't think they would find this many, um, but as they started to learn more and more, they uncovered 40 plus of these burials through the ground penetrating radar. Um, and from that, the historical society got involved. Uh, if you remember uh, November of 2020, we were all COVID zooming. So I uh, sent a message to Jeff saying we want to understand more about this. Um, this is a little bit of you know, background in terms of a historic image from the 30s showing the cemetery um, down and the trapezoidal thing here um, related to the uh, domestic complex. Now, currently, the cemetery is located within a golf course. Um, so it presents some challenges in terms of how do we look at the context of this site. Um, but the site itself is related to the Gilmer and the Craven and the Hotop family who own P Penn Park. And we believe that um, the individuals that we have found in these unmarked graves are related to enslaved individuals who worked for the Gilmers and the Cravens, and possibly also uh, workers after emancipation who continued to work on the property with the Hotops. So there might be a longer community history here. Um, did a lot of great research on this, and we can talk about this even more. Sam Towler, who's uh, on my board here and a local resident in uh, Charlottesville and Albemarle, long history, um, has worked with Lorenzo and Diane on numerous other projects, um, uncovering great deal of history about the cemetery, and have also had a great uh, fortune of being able to partner with a lot of different people locally, the Jefferson Madison Regional Library. Uh, we also had Al Jazeera Plus do a documentary, a short on this. Um, there's some of the references uh, to those. I can put those in the chat. Um, and you can see on the right hand side uh, a snowy picture and some of these depressions that show up with the snow that's still in them. Uh, so um, we've had a lot of great work with interns and other people working on this um, and uh, look forward to talking more about it. And uh, I can share this as we go on. And uh, I'll stop sharing and we can jump into the questions. Okay, so so I'm gonna have Grant talk about the Anson Street burial grounds in the Charleston area. So the audience will get a glimpse of something that's going on in Virginia, Charleston, and then we'll go to Dr. Rhonda Thomas to talk about the project there she was involved in. Grant? Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Thank you. I was uh, <clears throat> involved with the Anson Street Burial Ground, um, Anson Street uh, Cemetery that was found underneath the Gill Yard in 2013 when I was with the Gullah Society with Dr. Adia Funyan. Um, I continue that work on now, but the group continues to work on that even after the death of Dr. O. Um, <clears throat> and 
it was really interesting because we did ancient DNA testing of the bones um, remains. I think some of the first of its kind. We were um, professionally published twice. Um, one about the um, DNA with the haplogroups and the genomes and everything, as well as the dental calculus on the remains for the second part, talking about the eating habits and everything. <clears throat> and it was uh, found in a section of um, where Ancestry Street and Charleston, um, I'll pull a map up here. It's easy to do that there. I just do the share screen. Yes. Okay. See here. Okay. Right. It's coming. There we go. Can you see that? Yes. Um, okay. It's a document right now. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I was on the right one. This one here, the map? Yeah, we had the map first. There you go. There's the <clears> map. <throat> okay. This is basically uh, the peninsula, peninsula of Char Charleston. I had originally um, done a uh, or worked on a a uh, project about the cemeteries in just downtown Charleston, the peninsula of Charleston. <laughs> and if you go from Pittsburgh Avenue, which is up in this general vicinity here to the tip of the battery from the river to river, it's about seven and a half square miles of peninsula. And I have currently documented within that seven and a half square miles, 117 cemeteries. Wow. Uh, Charleston was uh, <clears throat> kind of unusual in its growth because originally Charleston started as the walled city down in this section, but there were on the, uh, the rest of the peninsula, it wasn't landfill um, that was still open rather than landfill. You had plantation cemeteries, family cemeteries, but within the wall, you had the big white church cemeteries. <clears throat> and um, the first, um, I'll bring this up here. Let me see here. So of all of those cemeteries, you said the hundred and some, how many of those off the top of your head are, are considered African-American cemeteries? African-American, it... African oh. descent, or African, about 85%. Okay. Wow. Right 80... downtown. And of right. that 85%, about 85% have been destroyed. They're under buildings, houses, streets, fields, auditoriums, that mm -hmm. type of thing. Um, <clears throat> and... This is, as we sit right now, this is the cemetery that I have found in Charleston County alone broken into the different things. But the ones I wanted to show you were the peninsula cemeteries. It's just in itself. This is all the cemeteries that are in the peninsula. You see them colored and everything. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> right and um, down here is... Okay, and I can see the museum right over there, too. Correct. Um, <clears throat> right here is where that cemetery, the, the um, Anson Street Cemetery, was located. They did the range on the um, remains from 1730-ish, 1765-ish. It was owned by the Ellis family. Uh, ironically, <clears throat> this is also located on the end of Gadsden's Green, originally was called Gadsden's Green. So the museum is right here at the head where the wharf was at. And this is on the very back part of Gatson's Green. And it was separated by a wall. There was a brick wall that ran the length here. <clears throat> and this street that was over here before, there was an auditorium was called Wall Street. And when they found this while they were doing the building, they thought it had been previously, previously undiscovered um, since it's been covered up and completely forgotten about. But I found through research in the newspaper that it was actually found in the very early 1900s, but when they expanded George Street this way, because this wasn't originally here, they were doing a house in this general vicinity, <clears throat> and they dug up some remains doing a sewer line, and they thought this was 1926, and they thought it was just like one-off remains for, um, you know, somebody's uh, um, servants in the backyard of a house or something that was originally mm -hmm. there. The coroner collected the bones, <clears throat> of course, the coroner's report, coroner's information that they have on record goes back to 1927. We don't have anything prior to 27. So they had written the newspaper. They said it was old, you know, bones as pre, you know, it wasn't anything new or anything. So <clears throat> when they dug these up, they were able to determine um, 
who had been in the colonies for more than five years, less than five years, who had been born in Africa um, by the strontium radiation level of the bone. And they, it was quite a, an expanse on the different people were there. Ironically, none of the people in the cemetery DNA related to any, any each other. So <clears throat> we actually put out into the general public, um, or the general African-American public, uh, DNA kits that were given to us by um, National Geographic Association when they were doing them at the time because they had funded our project. Uh, and out of the hundred and something kits that we had, none of them matched anybody. So we kind of thought it was a long shot. But when we had nobody even, you know, distantly match, <clears throat> it was, you know, a little bit disheartening. But we also knew it was a, a, a long shot to begin with. Mm -hmm. However, when we released the information, uh, my understanding, we released the information for the first report for peer review. Um, we inadvertently released some uh, DNA information on the second report. And we figured out what we did. We told them we took the thing back. Um, <clears throat> and this was after peer review going up to be published. And somehow in that 24, 48 period of time, there was a DNA company that harvested that information. So we had no idea. <clears throat> and about six months after this, I got a phone call from a gentleman from this organization said, I want to talk to you about one of your burials. And I said, which one are you talking about? Because when we go around to the schools and everything, <clears throat> first thing we're asked by the younger schools is what, what are their names? So, of course, we had no names. So we knew by the, the haplo group the, from the genome and the haplo group, we knew where these remains had come from geographically. So we picked names out of that area and let the children decide what the name for each person was going to be. So the person he was talking about was a gentleman named Zimbu. And I can't right remember off my head where he's from. But I said, yeah, you know, what would you like to know? I can only tell you what I, you know, because we don't have any definitive information on anything else, lineal anything. He said, well, my DNA matches Zimbu's DNA. There's connection. And I'm I was, I said, excuse me? <laughs> I was going to say the same thing. Excuse me. <laughs> and he said, yes, from what I can tell, my how many great grandfather is mm -hmm. Simbu's brother. That's a, a, a familiar awesome. connection with that. And I was uh, beside myself. I said, that's great. And so I talked for a while, got off the phone. I immediately called Dr. Theodore Scherr and Raquel Fleskis and said, hey, we've got a match. And we were all, you know, fantastic. And, uh, plus, he's originally from Williamsburg, which is next county up. So all the stuff fell into place. Um, <clears throat> okay. We reburied him in a, a reburial ceremony. And um, we had all sorts of um, different uh, religions and um, practices um, at the um, reburial ceremony. And there's currently, it's covered by a marble slab with a brass plate and they're in the process of building a uh, a monument to go on there. And I think the final monument is something in the center, but it has all these different hands, like pairs of hands around the outside. And I know several people that were hand models for it. And I'm just waiting for it when it comes up. But right. that's that's the one with the Anson Street. Um, there's okay. so many cemeteries around, but that's that was the one that I was deeply involved with. Okay. Well, Dr. Thomas, you want to share with us about the project you've been involved in? Um, sure, um, I can do that. I, um, as I mentioned, I am the coordinator of research and community engagement for Clemson University's Woodland Cemetery and African American Burial Ground Project. I'm going to try and um, show you all the. Um, if I can get this to work. Um, nope, I can't. So I'm going to stop. Okay. Um, gonna try and um so the 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 website is um clemson.edu backslash cemetery. I'll put that in the chat in just a moment. Okay. Um, our project started um in this space, I will say of the project started in uh, July of 2020. Um I had given a call my name tour, which included a stop at Woodland Cemetery and a very small one acre. Uh, area of that um, cemetery that was called at that time the Fort Hill Slave and Convict Cemetery. So I told folks to go look at it. We didn't have a chance. A couple of students came back, looked at it. At that time, the fence was falling down. It was full of trash. 
uh, completely neglected. Our students just wanted to clean it up and uh, put a memorial down. And so uh, if you're familiar with Clemson University, the cemetery itself is located right next to our stadium, um, our memorial stadium where our football players um, play. Um, so we looked into getting the memorial. We got the administration on board. This is a very short version of that process, mm -hmm. uh, but they wanted to know the number of graves uh, that were in um, that area, that one acre area. Um, but as we were preparing for that, we noticed that uh, there were field stones throughout the cemetery that seemed a little strange. Um, our team was doing some research in the archive and came across a document from 1960 where Clemson had gotten uh, permission to disinter graves from what was then known as the African-American burial ground on the west side of the cemetery and reinter them on that south side. So we thought, hmm, maybe we should check the entire 17.5 acre cemetery. So when that happened, uh, anomalies believed to be uh, unmarked burials of African-Americans, including enslaved people, sharecroppers, convict laborers, and wage workers were located throughout uh, the cemetery. So that's how we started. Um, the ground penetrating radar uh, was that first phase. Um, so we are now doing research. Uh, we have hired a genealogist. We have a community engagement assistant. Uh, we have historians. Uh, our students are involved in helping us do this research. We have programs um, both for campus and the local community. Uh, we formed a community engagement council for the descendant community. So they have been with us from the very beginning. We now um, are coming to the end of our first phase of the beautification of the cemetery. New pathways have been installed. There's a new gate uh, that's being put up on the north side just across from uh, the, the stadium. Uh, we also, I and some community partners got a grant from the Mellon Foundation to put a Black Heritage Trail on our campus and in the local cities. So the cemetery is one of those stops. So there's new interpretive signage that's going to be put in. Uh, we just also were authorized to build a memorial for black laborers on our campus. So we have hired the architect uh, who is going to lead us in the feasibility study. So that memorial will have, uh, will be in honor of people who are buried in the, in the African-American burial ground, but also for all of the black laborers. So enslaved people, sharecroppers, the convicted laborers who worked and some who died and are believed to be buried in the African-American burial ground uh, while they were working at Clemson uh, and also wage workers who were living and working on campus during the Jim Crow era. So uh, one of the things I can talk more about is the need for collaboration. Mm -hmm. uh, this started off with my doing a tour, students being involved are concerned about the state, the neglected state of the burial ground because our trustees are stewards of our cemetery, they had to get involved. So now we have the trustees involved. Uh, there was a legacy council established to kind of uh, shepherd along this process of preservation and memorialization. Uh, the GPR work had to be done. We hired uh, New South Associates to create our preservation plan. Uh, and then when the, you know, the beautification progress process was put in place, uh, this long-term preservation plan is being uh, edited and completed. The memorial phase, right? As you can think in your mind <laughs> with the dollar signs getting bigger and bigger. Yes. Um, this is very, very uh, expensive work. Um, so later on, I also would like to talk about some of the resources that are available yes. uh, for people who are doing this work, maybe on a smaller scale, but also the opportunities to, to collaborate with universities to mm -hmm. tap into additional resources that might be available uh, for churches or organizations or cities that are also doing the work. We'll definitely take advantage of that, definitely. <laughs> and and for the folks attending, I hope y'all are taking notes because um, even though I'm recording this, we just heard pathway from each person that that told us about their project, number one, burial ground was found or cemetery was found, correct? They went to the community, number two, and now they got people all at the table, pretty much bringing resources, information, connections, and then the research that's being done. 
But as you all know, researching African-American ancestry comes with its challenges. This is no different if we're looking at a burial ground, except that we got everybody in one place per se. Mm -hmm. So for whoever wants to go first with this, what, what are some of these challenges that the research has presented to you? And I think I'll go to Diane first and then I'll go to Lorenzo. But as far as hearing about this, being involved in this, what challenges have you as a descendant, you know, of enslaved individuals, what challenges throughout the research have you actually experienced or gone through? I think with Ben Park is uh, specifically challenging because we have no idea who's buried and turred out there. And we are literally imagining, trying to reimagine what we are, we're imagining. We don't mm -hmm. really know. I would like to show this little video because it will express exactly what I witnessed recently and what's going on currently is that we don't really know um, what cemeteries have been uh, repurposed for recreational deserts. We, I would like to know more about what, where we can find resources to study that and learn more about that. Mm -hmm. Was it done primarily during the urban, urban renewal era? Mm -hmm. Those kinds of things. So the resources and education needs to be there. And I'm going to try to play this video. Um, it might have been better to give send, put the video in the chat and see if I can play it as the host. Okay, let me see. And we can try that. And okay. one of the things I want to mm -hmm. note is that when um, Tom talked or one of you shared that there were, it was three plantations over time. So you're now looking at three slaveholding families mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to try to find out who would have been there, who would have, you, you know, been involved per se, which is another challenge. Right. It's not. And not so um, I think that's important for folks to understand. I heard Craven. I heard, was it Hopstep? Hopstep. Oh, Tom. Um, Tom? It was the uh, George Gilmer, um, who Gilmer. Was associated with Jefferson. It was John Craven, who also had a C Jefferson connection in terms of agricultural interests. Mm -hmm. um, and then it was the Hotop family who were emancipation, um, but they were also very heavily involved in the community. And it's a, it's a really interesting. I mean, the picture in the background is kind of from the vantage point of the african-american enslaved burial ground um and you know the fact that you have these three very prominent charlottesville families with their walled enclosed cemeteries um and you can look them up and figure out all kinds of history on them um but when the gpr survey was done it basically doubled the size of this cemetery so within the wow. family burial ground there's like 40 or 50 within these three families and then outside of it is about 40 to 50 so half of this history is unknown and you know how we're trying to piece it together through as you well understand Shelley and in terms of understanding African-American genealogy is kind of pulling on multiple threads and looking mm -hmm. at various ways in which we can you know uncover it so and and definitely and I'm coming to you why she's um until she gives me that link there but it's definitely a challenge just getting through those three plantations and three different, you know, three different times per se. They might be around the same time, but the records, you know, that's one of the biggest challenges is the scarcity of some records. And as we all know, African Americans that were enslaved were considered property. So, how many property records still exist from, say, 1840, 1830, whatever time frame you're looking at? And I heard um, Grant say 1730. Oh my goodness, that just shrunk it all the way down <laughs> to maybe a handful right mm -hmm. there. So, so Lorenzo, you as a filmmaker and a descendant of Castle Hill enslaved and others as well, 
what is your role from the filmmaker's perspective when you hear about the Penn Park or even the Anson or the Clemson Burial Ground? What, is that, what does that do to you as far as a filmmaker in telling these stories? Yeah, um, for me, um, one of the things that stands out is that, you know, for me growing up, um, there were great aunts and uncles and even great, great aunts and uncles and great, great grandparents that were still living, right? Um, and my great, great aunt recently passed away about a year and a half ago. She was 106 when she passed. Um, but, you know, my children's generation, they don't have that generation to go to. Um, those folks are, are no longer with us in, 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 a, in a large sense. Um, so as a filmmaker, um, a lot of it is also being able to to talk with people while we can. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that pre presents the, its own challenges, right? African-Americans have experienced a lot <laughs> in this country. And a lot of times when you speak to the elders, um, either they don't believe they, they know a lot of history, right? They may have heard bits and pieces from parents and that sort of thing, but they don't believe that it's necessarily something that's important or they're not going back to think about it. Um, or they just don't want to talk about mm -hmm. um, that history. You know, there's a lot of a lot of pain and hurt and that sort of thing um, with that history. So a lot of it is being able to to talk with folks and 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 them opening up and sharing what they do know. And then it's for me to kind of take that in and piece it together. Sure. sure. Mm -hmm. And and also in my experience as well, there's also people that were told not to talk about it mm -hmm. in the family. Mm -hmm. And yep. that has come through generations. And yeah. so that's a critical factor. I am going to attempt to play the video and I think we lost Diane, but I am going to uh, attempt to play this and let's see how that comes out and and we'll go from there. Let's see. And I'm a little slow. Nope, it says it can't find the server. So I'm gonna move along. So coming back to, and I wanna use the word the words cemetery preservation for all of these projects and the engagement that you guys are involved in. Can you describe some current initiatives and Dr. Thomas, I'll go with you first, some current initiatives that are aimed at preserving African-American cemeteries and how do how did you engage with the communities that were involved and, and things like that to gain support? And that should go to all of the the projects. Yeah, sure. I just want to say something um, that yeah. relates to the last question that you asked. Uh, and, you know, how do you document uh, unmarked burials? One of the things that we're doing at Clemson uh, with our genealogists and our historians is that we're creating a database of all of the names that we can find. Uh, and sometimes they're in property records, sometimes they're in deeds, sometimes they're in letters. Uh, wherever we find them. And then we're trying to find out who do we have a record of, like if we have an inventory from 1854 and we have another one from 1865, one of the things we're doing is like, who isn't on the 1865 inventory? So it's kind of a process of deductive reasoning where you're like, okay, they were here in 1854. She was a hundred years old, right? Um, so she's not going to be there in 1865. So we're trying to come up with kind of this subset of names of people who actually might be buried in the cemetery based on the fact that they are not reappearing in the records that we're finding. Uh, it is not exact science <laughs> and it's yeah. very tedious, but it is one way of trying to at least come up with a list of possibilities. So as far as um, how do you go about um, your preservation work, um, one of the things that you can do is just hire companies um, that do preservation plans. Um, mm -hmm. We hired New South Associates. They're a company that works out of South Carolina. Um, they brought in their whole team, you know, to talk to us about our work, uh, to do the history. Um, also, um, the cemeteries that I'm now working with in Casey, 
um, they were able to, the city of Casey got a grant from South Carolina Department of Archives and Histories, History to hire a historian to come in and do that initial wave of documenting whatever could be found. Um, so you can determine what you have. And then that's kind of the first step, like what's here? What history do we know? What history don't we know, right? What do we need to find out? Who in the area can help us? Uh, Lorenzo talked about who are those elders? Like who are those folks in the community that have that oral history? Uh, so I think it's really kind of assessing uh, the site itself and all the resources that are available to help you document that site. Um, that helps you know, like, what do I need for my preservation plan? Uh, for the Casey sites, we're thinking about setting up a nonprofit um, because one of the cemeteries is on city land, the other one is not. Uh, at Clemson, because we are a university, um, the trustees will eventually approve that preservation plan. And then the university will have this guide that says, as long as there is a Clemson, we will do these things to make sure the cemetery is protected, it is preserved, it is well maintained, that everyone is buried, who is buried here is honored. Okay, excellent. And Grant, did, did the project, the Anson Street, was there initiatives that were aimed at preserving? I think you mentioned a couple, but how, what did they do to engage the community to become involved and support that effort? Because you remarked about the celebration and the memorial type thing. And so how did they go about some of that engagement and, and preserving? Is it protected now? that Anson Street burial ground? Cause you know, we can put a monument up and it's not protected. You know, right. the monument is fine sitting there, but as far as where the actual burial ground, is it fenced off? Cause you're talking about something right downtown in Charleston. Right. <clears throat> the, um, well, first of all, about the protection of the cemetery, it's on city property. Okay. And, and um, it's off the walkway in the middle of a, um, like a floral area flowers and different things are at but it, it's got the clack and it's got the thing on top of it later on they've done that and it's kind of you have to know where it's at there's no real indication on the outside for that very reason so people won't go and you know mess with it or anything like that but you can still see it if you go up to it um but they're making the monument to go there and i'm it's on city property plus there's a the police substation right there they got all the police cars parked out behind and everything so it's it's in a pretty decent area of downtown okay. Charleston. Um, <clears throat> as with the community um, interactions with the, the two geneticists, Dr. Theodore Schur and Dr. Raquel Fleskis, both uh, Theodore Schur is with the University of Pennsylvania and she was with UPenn at one time, now she's someplace else. <clears throat> um, they interacted with the community showing different phases of what we were doing, um, how we were doing things. And then that included doing the DNA tests and then coming back and talking about the DNA tests. And, you know, there's, I can't remember the exact number, but it was, uh, it was it, look, probably a little under 10, is my understanding, the community interactions or whatever. And uh, they're, they're, they just had another one. And I think they're going to be planning another one here in the next six months or so as the, the plan, as the uh, research <clears throat> goes farther. Um, but yeah, we've been, the community has been in step We've talked, spoke, kept, kept them right along with us and what we were doing um, and, you know, keeping them engaged, you know, because it, in, it is the community that may have a better connection than one person in the city, you know. <clears throat> so, so another thought on that, and this is for all of these projects, is um, these burial grounds or, or what they are called now cemeteries. There's not any headstones from what I understand. Is that correct? Yes, so ma'am. You've are, got the ground penetration, the ground, you know, radar penetration. Yes, ma'am. And and collecting the names of people that were enslaved on these plantations or in these areas. And then, like mm -hmm. Dr. Thomas said, so we're looking for who's who was there and who's not there within a time period. Yes. So how <clears throat> is that that also presents a challenge as well because the names spellings 
um, the buying and selling of enslaved people, the renting of enslaved people, <laughs> the mortgaging, and I and I can go on. So I think there is even more challenges almost coming in attacking this. And again, I think the community is really key because there could be more information that could come to the table. So kudos to all of you for involving the community. Now, what about descendants? And I'm gonna go to Tom and then I'll go to Lorenzo. What about descendants? Uh, any engagement or what has come up re regarding any descendants on uh, the Penn Park project in Charlottesville? <laughs> Yes, exactly. Um, you know, we we needed to bring that voice to the table. Um, you know, I was able as the historical society to kind of look to the city and say, we can help you with this. Um, but also, you know, the respect and the honor that needs to be shown to this burial ground is is more to give the modern descendants a voice for their ancestors. Um, it, it's not doing it for them. And that's, you know, that's not something I want to be involved in. So the, you know, coming back to what Dr. Thomas was saying in terms of collaboration and partnerships, I mean, with Penn Park being a public park, a public city park, I mean, there's an opportunity here uh, to really bring this front and center in terms of understanding more about our local history. Uh, between the city of Charlottesville, Ravan Archaeological Services that helped with doing the survey, um, even on a larger state level, the Department of Historic Resources are really putting a lot of effort towards understanding African-American burial grounds all across the state. Um, and this is just one example. Um, but in the local community here, there's been a group, you know, for the past 20, 30 years between the Central Virginia History Researchers, who's kind of a loosely formed group of historians and avocational folks, but also tying into Monticello um, with, you know, what the Getting Word project that was there. Um, with Montpelier, with uh, what was you know most commonly called the rubric, or um, the engaging descendant communities and the interpretation of slavery that really put front and center the fact and the need that a descendant voice has to be there, um, that has to be primary, and to then look at this and say, um, you know, there are there are means by which we can do this but it requires the community effort in that. Um, and when, you know, one of the next steps that we're looking at in terms of understanding the cemetery, because it isn't a public park, because it is on a golf course, you know, the GPR has allowed us to say, we have a significant burial ground here related to a very early period, you know, pre Albemarle County, in some cases, maybe even with this plantation, that, um, we need to understand and respect it. And therefore, we need to understand the extent of it. So we are in preliminary conversations with the city so that the descendants can be requesting this to say, you now own this land. And therefore, what is it? You know, how do you define it? What is the limits of the cemetery? Does the the water line or the electric line or the you know golf cart path cross over any burials you know out of respect and honor we need to make sure that that is repaired and you know there's some kind of reparation there to make that whole so it's a it's a step in that direction but really you know how i view it personally as a historical society guy who had involvement with montpelier and with everything that went on with the montpelier descendant community with you know trying to have an equal share at the table you know, I want to put front and center the descendant voice, um, because without that, um, this is not, you know, it's not going to be what we need it to be. It has to be a ref representation, a reflection of this history that has been forgotten and unknown, but not anymore. And we need to make that front and center. Which, which leads me to, and thank you for that, which leads me to education and awareness. How are schools and, and Lorenzo, I'm coming to you first, but um, how are schools, museums, local communities, are they working with you to increase that awareness and education about these African-American burial grounds? And again, are there resources and programs that can help do that? And of course, I think of a film would be an automatic, but I don't want to speak for you. And then I'll go to you, Dr. Thomas, and then back over to Grant about the education and awareness. 
Yeah, so, um, I mean, and for those for those who don't know, and Tom touched on that a little bit, which is just an interesting part of this story, right? That, um, you know, what we've seen even in the the slides that that Tom showed us, we've seen the the, the burial the burial ground, and it's a a small it's a corner, right, of of Penn Park. Penn Park has tennis courts and trails, and you know, uh, playground and a golf course, and for us descendants and you know myself being born and raised in Albemarle County my parents took me to Penn Park to play on the playground mm -hmm. all the time as a child mm -hmm. um you know one side of my family had their family reunion at Penn Park all the time mm -hmm. every every um, summer but no one ever knew that this burial ground was here because it's kind of kind of out of the way in the back of the property it's a large property um so where you would go to to the pavilion area for like a family reunion, a barbecue or play on the playground, you never see this section. Um, so it's interesting because we're learning about this, um, about this history kind of for the first time. Um, the very first film that I did, I believe Tom mentioned Sam Towler that's done a lot of this research. Um, he connected my family to a place called Castle Hill, which that place, that former plantation is right across the street from the house that I grew up in. Mm -hmm. uh, it's right there. Um, so we kind of knew about that connection a bit, but mm -hmm. here it's 10 years later when we find out more information that kind of pushed that family information back another couple of generations, which then connected us to, to Penn Park. Um, and right now, as far as um, engaging the community and others, you know, awareness being made um we have gone out to to local church um here in the area and i think uh the historical society has plans to do to do more of that um so we've gone out to to local church and um uh, made them aware of all of the surnames that were connected to Penn park um to the enslaved there um to allow them to understand who was there at least the family names um, to share information and, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, but Shelly, I love your idea about a film. So. I, <laughs> putting a plug, but right. again, I'm also hoping we're giving ideas to other people in different communities across the United States that might be experiencing the same thing. And again, it seems like that, that common theme of being in the city, you know, and again, it might be because of the historical aspects of that. But I think, and I do keep checking for Diane to come back in. So don't worry. I hope we didn't lose her. But anyway, no, so. Um, yeah, ahead, we, Diane, I mean, Diane also in the connection to Castle Hill, but she's made a, a point of saying from like 1800 to 1830 in terms of her own genealogical research, yeah. she's understood that, you know, her family descends from multiple plantations of which Penn Park, Castle Hill That's and right. others are just a portion of it. Um, and, you know, the reality of, you know, just telling that history, just to be able to say, you know, and I'll just share my screen really quickly. Um, you know, this is an example of all the family names that we've been able to uncover as part of our research so far. Uh, so you can see the Dickerson family down there, uh, Gibbons family, and the, and and I we specifically put it through Gilmer ownership, Craven mm -hmm. ownership, mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. because so it's designating company. back to the plantation it's, owner at that time. And it's it's a painful thing to realize, but yeah. all of this information. And I'll come back to this is because of property and the sure. sense that in the Gilmer family, we were able to find this 1804 document of which 70 to 80 slaves are being divided up amongst wow. the family members. Mm -hmm. And from that, then we're able to trace forward um, to help, you know, make those connections. But the reality um, that our shared history is is one of ownership in that regards and that enslavement aspect and how it's been forgotten. I mean, we need we, we can't forget that because um, it impacts us, us on a day to day basis in terms of us as Americans understanding our own past. Is is there and this is for all of you, is there legislation and policies that are existing or being proposed laws or anything that can help address the preservation and also the recognition of these African-American burial sites 
And and again, how can those policies support and what we're going to call or I'm going to call historical sites right now? Um, because as you tap into this history, you're also talking about what was going on, who was there, what experiences, their lives, whatever we can find. So is there any existing or proposed laws that any of you know that help address the preservation about these burial grounds? And Tom, I, I'll, I'll start with you and then go to Grant. Um, well, I do know on a state level, uh, the Virginia Department of Historic Resources um, have some funds that have been focused very specifically on uncovering and finding African-American burial grounds, enslaved burial grounds, plantation enslaved burial grounds on private property. So it's 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 that public private kind of thing, you know, working here with the city property, you know, there's a lot more opportunity where we can tap into resources work with our partnerships and collaborations when you get onto private property then there are certain things you know you know uh, virginia is a is a private property state so you know they it, property rights are fundamental um but you know in terms of being able to uncover that history and place it into a context so um and then on a national level like uh, dr thomas mentioned the mellon um, grants right. I mean, there's a lot of people out there who realize um, that this connection, this history, this long span needs to be understood and that, you know, what Grant was showing or telling us about the Charleston cemeteries and that, you know, mm -hmm. how many total that he found and how, what the percentage of that has been destroyed. Um, and that is, you know, a common occurrence in many cases throughout, mm -hmm. you know, even in rural areas, you know, with, sure. uh, you know, big, uh, you know, Amazon things and, you know, giant warehouses and solar farms and these things that are popping up in these, you know, rural areas that no one really thought about. And they're like, oh, tax base, taxes, great. Oh, there's something in the way. Oh, it's something that we don't even know in our history books. So therefore it's not important, but it's, that's not the case because it was a selective, right. it was people being selective writing histories. So um, but yeah, you can go out there and look, uh, the National Trust, uh, the Department of Historic Resources, your local state agencies, uh, to see and find um, available funding and um, legislation for this. Grant, what about there in South Carolina? Well, <clears throat> going back to real quick about the education part, I have not done a lot of education, you know, on people like in group form, like classrooms and that type thing. I'm more on the, you know, the civilian level out in the street. Um, I have done a couple of classes, but <clears throat> what I found is that cemeteries are easily out of sight of the mind. If mm -hmm. nobody knows about it or is forgotten about, the next generations don't know about it, especially when we had the great exodus, you know, or the migration north of the African-American families and stuff, if you didn't pass that information on the next generation, you just lost that family cemetery. It's gone. Mm -hmm. And um, over the time I've been doing this, <clears throat> um, Lots of times that uh, I haven't done African-American cemetery, I mean, family or genealogy, but now I've had the past 10, 15 years, that's the majority of what I do because there's a lot more interested in finding out about their family and that type of thing. Um, because one thing I say is you cannot have genealogy without cemeteries. You cannot have cemeteries without genealogy. Right. First thing they ask you doing a genealogy, where are they buried? That type of thing. But with the um, laws in effect, we just had a, a city of Charleston just passed an ordinance a year and a half ago, I think it was, um, to protect more of these properties in downtown. Mm -hmm. um, we found we had one cemetery <clears throat> that was on 88 Smith Street um, down in downtown Charleston, below Calhoun Street. And... Um, we were, this is with the Gullah Society, we were um, asked by a uh, development company to go in there and look about, because they heard word there was a cemetery on it. <clears throat> this is what Doc was talking to me. And I said, I told him right off the bat, I said, they're not going to buy this property because I already knew how big the cemetery was. Dang. You know, it was two pieces of property combined, but the one piece where the house is at was 8,000 square feet. There's almost 2,000 barrels and 8,000 square feet. Wow. You know, <clears throat> and the... um so when they realized how much was on there, um, it was the thing that fell between the cracks with the real estate agent, the people doing the selling, and then it was a family that owned it. 
But what they didn't really bring up was the family that had owned it for the past 50 years had taken the known gravestones that were in the back mm-hmm. and made a barbecue grill out of one. They lined their cement sidewalk out of one with the names popping up. You know, <clears throat> now with the current homeowner, we've gone in to try to retrieve those um, uh, stones. And about halfway into it, they quickly put a stop to it. And I've since looked in there and the stones have disappeared. We have no idea where they're at. And um, so we took all this information and um, obviously went to the city and said, hey, we've got some stuff falling between the cracks here. And then when I told them the sheer number of cemeteries that are in the peninsula of Charleston, they um, made they, they passed an ordinance where South Carolina's ordinance <clears throat> is there, but it's very archaic and very antiquated, meaning that when they did the Santee Cooper project, filled the two Santee lakes in, they had a bunch of the lower lakes had plantations. <clears throat> they moved some of them, they left some of them. As you can only imagine, there's a ton of black cemeteries in that area. But with South Carolina law, all you had to do was put a notification in the newspaper for 30 days that you were going to do this. If they got no word back in 30 days, they were free and clear to do something. Whoa. You know, that's I think. So a lot of these that's but, a red flag up for folks. But the problem <laughs> is, is you law. got to realize, well, you realize when all this was happening, this was during Jim Crow. So who in the world is going to raise their hand to an right. old cemetery they don't know much about? You know, they know ancestors are buried there. <clears throat> but in downtown Charleston, you know, because of the way Charleston was built and how it developed over the years and everything is a very unique situation, you know, the way it was built. And so the way the state law read, is if um, you have no newspaper in the area, then you nail it to the courthouse door for 30 days. Mm-hmm. And that's what it read. Mm-hmm. So we took this and they decided to beef it up a little bit. And I don't know the exact um, penalties or whatever, but where the state was, you know, it's like 1,500 and or 30 days in jail. I'm just saying that. Where the city went above and beyond and said for every day you don't follow that, it's an individual charge for each day. So, um, you cannot, the way it reads is you cannot do any ground disturbing activity whatsoever if you're told by a person there's a cemetery on your property, if you heard from the grapevine there's a cemetery on your property, um, if somebody shows you a plat with an old cemetery on there but hadn't had one on the plat for the last hundred years, if there's any indication there's a cemetery on your property, you have to stop all ground disturbing activities until you have the historical research done on the property by like a Brockington Associates or New South, that type mm-hmm. thing, mm-hmm. you know, <clears throat> which we thought that was a win win. Um, but then, you know, like the, if everybody's familiar with Charleston, the Citadel football stadium sits on the left side of the peninsula. It's an old public burial ground underneath the Citadel football stadium, Harmon field across the street and the field house across there. There's 30 something thousand graves under that thing. Oh my goodness. You know, and that's a, that's what last of the public cemeteries in downtown Charleston. You know, there's five public cemeteries in downtown Charleston alone. But put it in perspective, when they moved from the B Street um, Public Cemetery in 1841 and moved to Tower Hill, which is Citadel, between 1841 and 1927, where they closed that city public burial ground, in that seven and a half square miles, they buried over 68,000 people in that seven and a half square miles. Just to show you the, the, the in-depth of these cemeteries in this place. The magnitude is unbelievable. <laughs> unbelievable. Yeah. And, so, and- it's interesting because this is bigger than what we're talking about, you know, and and, and we're hearing that. And you're just talking about one location. Dr. Yeah. Thomas, I wanted to follow up on some of those resources that you mentioned. And then I want to pose a last question before we go to the audience there <laughs> on, on future directions and things. So if you'll share some of the things you mentioned about um, the resources and things that people can use if somewhere in their community, they're faced with a situation of a burial ground. Mm. Yeah, I I would say um, the first place to look is to see if your state has a archive historical uh, department. South Carolina has the South Carolina Department of Archives and History. Um, for those of you who are in South Carolina, I know Georgia has a similar um, uh, entity at the state level. Um, they will have a website that has resources that are available. It usually includes the laws that are pertaining to the protection of historic cemeteries in your state. Um, that's a good place to start. And also, if they go to your local city council, 
um, to talk about what uh, local ordinances or city ordinances um, might be um, applicable to uh, your particular burial ground. Uh, if there is a local college or university, um, check in with the history department uh, to see if there is a professor who would be willing to lend support uh, to documenting the cemetery themselves or enlisting the assistance of students uh, to do some of that research. Um, I think also looking into joining national organizations like the Black Cemetery Network uh, mm -hmm. is a good place. Just Google Black Cemetery Network. Uh, they will list your cemetery on uh, the network as one of the burial grounds. Um, also, I think um, joining that, taking part in the the conversations that are happening um, is another way. Um, looking for grants, uh, they are not <laughs> numerous, but they are out there. Um, so it's say looking to find if you um, partnering, we've been talking about collaboration. Um, it's very difficult to do this work by yourself. So um, okay. even if it's a, you know, if it's one partner, a, a local civic organization, um, we've even had, we are supporting a, a project at Clemson of some Girl Scouts in Simpsonville uh, got interested in a church cemetery and started doing some work. And we have been providing some, some support to them. Uh, but just being uh, out there, uh, but also I think as was mentioned earlier, um, sometimes you don't want to draw too much attention to your burial ground uh, mm -hmm. because of concerns about vandalism uh, and destruction of property. So you really have to know kind of what the concerns are about the burial ground that you are working with. Um, so please be sure that in doing this work, uh, you're not doing harm um, by bringing too much attention to that sacred space. Excellent, thank you for that. Um, any other comments on that before I go to this last question to you guys? <laughs> okay, because another thing is, and Annie Evans, who's from this uh, in Virginia area, she makes a comment. Please consider engaging local MS and HS middle school and high school teachers and students in this work as well. They are very interested in learning and working alongside scholars in their community. So a great point for that. And I also put in the chat and someone else had also noted and you did too, Dr. Thomas, about the Black um, Cemetery Network. And, and again, coming back to a comment that you said, a simple Google, ask the question. I was involved with stuff up in West Virginia, in, in Jefferson County, West Virginia, when a, a, a company was coming through to lay pipe, and it was within inches of the cemetery. And so it was a whole bunch of hoopla going on. And of course there was state legislation for protection and everything. But I think people in the communities and the people involved and the descendants need to figure out what those laws are, are and who needs to be at the table with you to start this going. And again, looking for the local group coming together and sharing that space and sharing information. So I want to pose a last question out to you guys, and that's future directions. Looking forward, what do you see as the critical next steps in preserving and honoring these African-American burial grounds? How can different stakeholders, like we've mentioned, government, communities, educational institutions, all come to that table together to make sure that these sites are treated with the respect and attention they deserve. And we've had comments about that, but is there one thing that you would share that you feel was a necessary uh, next step for your project that you've been involved in? And Grant, I'll go up to you. If you've got one thought that you, you are leaving people about the preservation and the honoring and the respect about these cemetery projects. I was working on the cemetery one time with uh, Dr. Ophonian and it was about, it was jungle and I was working on a gravestone on the ground and he had a couple come up there that was a, a rather local blue blood couple <clears throat> and I'm on the ground 
work on this gravestone. And this lady asked me, she said, why are you so interested in working on colored cemeteries? Mm. She could ask me in a couple of different ways, but Doc knew I wasn't going to stay quiet. So he tapped me with his shoe. <laughs> so I was eloquent in what I said. I said, man, <laughs> do you look and see those gravestones that are cemented into the wall for the on-ramp for I-26? She said, yeah. I said, you don't see that interstate going through your ancestors' graves in Magnolia, now do you? And I left it at that. Mm. <clears throat> Great point. You do this to your family if it was your family's burial ground. Mm -hmm. That's all you got to remember. And if you say yes, you know, I can't remember the exact saying, uh, Benjamin Franklin's that, you know, show me a community cemetery and I'll tell you how that community is. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, taking care yeah. of the dead as well as the living. So, yeah, that's why, you know, don't do it because it's not right. Tom? Yeah, I'll, I'll follow in that line. Respect, um, you know, it's and and also, you know, what it shows us about what we hold important as a community. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, and I've as a historical guy, as an archaeologist, you know, I've been in the Central Virginia region for years. Um, you know, this cemetery here at Penn Park is really for me kind of a microcosm of what is across all these plantation grounds, all of these places of enslavement throughout the Piedmont, um, where you can, you know, like at Montpelier, you can go to James Madison's grave and, and, you know, see all of his family buried there with the gravestones and the stone wall and everything. And now with the Montpelier descendants community, looking at the burial for the enslaved population and just simply understanding the extent of it. So this here at Penn Park is just a microcosm of what other museums and other municipalities are looking at. Um, and I think it gives us an opportunity uh, for outreach and to have our youth, as Annie mentioned, you know, look to the the school students here who, you know, are really, you know, from what we've experienced in our interaction with students and college kids, they are thirsty. They want to know, you know, what their history is, what the local history is. Um, and they're not getting it in the books and they're not getting it in the social media. They're, they need to see it on the ground. And this is like a perfect example of how that can be, you know, put there in front of them. Um, and, uh, you know, for me in, in, in Penn Park with, you know, the history of the white landowners versus the history of the enslaved, but in our modern community, both are still around, but one has been put above the other. And now we need to try to make that you know, make that more, you know, separate, yeah. but separate, but equal <laughs> as opposed yeah. to it was separate, but unequal. Okay. Dr. Thomas. Yeah. I echo um, a lot of the things that have already been said. Um, I just want to add uh, a couple of things. Our trustee who works um, with our cemetery project um, told me when we started that he wanted uh, the cemetery to become the epicenter of Clemson history and by that he meant, so our cemetery doesn't have just two cemeteries in it. It actually has three. So it has the Andrew Pickens Calhoun family plot, uh, the African-American burial ground, and then Woodland Cemetery, which was originally established in 1924 for white Clemson employees. So it is not a segregated cemetery. It is an integrated cemetery. All of those plots are um, right alongside each other. We have anomalies in the Calhoun family plot at the top of the hill um, that are believed to be those of African-Americans. So I think for me, it's to sort of think of these sacred spaces as places of history, um, places of history where we recover history. Um, I mentioned at the beginning of the program that there are two cemeteries in Casey that are associated with my family, um, originally affiliated with the St. Anne's Episcopal Church. Um, so the cemetery is left, but now I have learned that there was a church and there was a school and there was an orphanage and there was a building for the local women's association. So sometimes when we document these histories of cemeteries, we also learn about the local black community and there was a black neighborhood. So all of a sudden in kind of preserving that cemetery, we are recovering the history of a community not just in the cemetery, but all around the cemetery. And I think that goes to um, cemeteries that are located on plantations and recovering the history of the dead. We begin to 
recover the history of that community where there was life and love and labor all around. And so it helps us to remember life as we honor death. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Lorenzo, we're hearing a lot here. Right. <laughs> a lot. And, and, and we even, there's a piece that we didn't even dive into so much, and that's the technology, ground penetration. We heard DNA. Oh my goodness, DNA. You know, so I'm going to throw it to you again, the same question, kind of next steps and you and I know you're involved with some of the Penn Park and, and so forth, but you're also involved with the Memorial to the Enslaved Laborers. There's other aspects going on in the community. So so what is your critical next steps in this preservation or even the education piece of this? What what would be your advice or what you would like people to take away with, to go away with? I think um, two things really come to mind. One is, is for us to continue to, to tell these stories. Um, if we don't, no one will ever know. Um, and we'll never really uh, feel like they have a reason, right, to, to preserve these spaces and to learn um, more about them. And, and the other thing is really to, to um, create collective agency among the descendants of the folks interred at these spaces. Um, you know, there's there's power in numbers, right? Um, and if we are able to collectively come together to have our voices heard, um, even in this Penn Park, uh, in, in during in this process, Diane and I have known each other for years, um, but never knew how we were literally familiar, connected. And and once this Penn Park story came, um, we were able to to really put our finger on it and understand how we're um, blood related. Um, and that's one thing as, as Dr. Murphy mentioned, um, the Memorial to Enslaved Laborers at the University of Virginia, um, the descendants of enslaved communities, um, that nonprofit um, group of, of, um, of descendants uh, have come about to create that, to create that collective agency um, when it comes to uh, the research and the folks, uh, the names that have been added to the wall there um, and other things. So I think if we can create more of that than we can get a lot done. And I think that ties to all the projects. And Diane did text me a response. She said one of the, and, and I want to include this on the recording, one of the major challenges with Penn Park is that we had to build a repository from scratch make descendant connections from there. So again, another source of information and things that that people, that if they're getting ready to embark on a project, you know, to do this, we've heard so many things. I wanna go to the Q&A. Cheryl Love asked a question, and this is for you, Dr. Thomas. Will Clemson's work extend to Hobcall, Barnany, Friendship Village, Annie Carr specifically burial ground, and she says I'm a car descendant, and we got cars all over Virginia. Just just so people know, if people in the audience say, "Wait a minute, we got cars in Virginia," so I'll throw that question to you. Um, I am not sure. Um, I only work with the Woodland Cemetery and African American Burial Ground Project at Clemson University. However, in just a second, I will put. Uh, a link to a website that shows all of the uh, cemeteries throughout the state of South Carolina that Clemson University is currently documenting. Uh, after this project started, the university decided to do an inventory of all of its mm -hmm. land. And they found, I think there were up to 15 cemeteries um, that have been located on Clemson land. So that may be one of them, but I'll put that link uh, in the chat and you can check there. Okay, thank you for that. And and that's another idea is is communities having a list of cemeteries or the projects going on to be able to put out in case there's some connection. And Barbara asked a question, can anyone connect to the DNA that was found at the cemetery and how? Might want to throw that to you, Grant, since you mentioned the DNA um 
that's a tough one there, but I'll I'll give you know, it to you. We are, I know there was plans and I, I haven't heard anything to, you know, differentiate from that, that they are going to release this information to the general public to be compared to like Jed Match and different things like that. It's going to be a different process because of the remains so old. Mm -hmm. that thing, but it is my understanding they will become available. I'm just not sure when, if they haven't already. I have not been told yet. <clears throat> and DNA might have a whole nother aspect of how we're looking at and, and making that connection as well. Correct. Because you got to think with DNA, even with DNA, um, <clears throat> out of the years that I've done this, I've only traced two families back to the actual boat. Mm -hmm. What record do you have? You might yeah. be able to find out where that person Absolutely. came from or was purchased from, but that doesn't mean they came from there. They may come from inner Africa. Absolutely. So you have to take other information and work around. Like one of the girls that we had on there uh, that was in there had her teeth shaved in a certain way that they do for rite of passage type things. Mm -hmm. Where her haplogroup group was, I think there was only a couple of tribes in that general geographic area that did that. That did that. So you shrank it down more, but it's not, you know, there's not a definitive. If I had, every time you say, hey, I want to know what tribe I came from. <laughs> you know, sure. it's, it's one of those things. It's not quite there yet, maybe in the future, but it could give you at least a generalized area. There, And thank you for that from all of you. There are resources that are in the chat. And people, if you look in the chat, if you look to the three dots on the right-hand side, it should give you the option um, for you to save the chat to be able to see some of the resources that was shared. And, and as we're closing this out, first, I want to thank all of you for being here. And, and what's interesting and personal for me is the cultural significance as well. Because these burial sites, it doesn't matter if they're marked or unmarked, they still contribute. And, and following up the points that all of you made to our understanding of African-American culture and history in the communities. And so they're teaching us something also. And and they're, it's almost like they're reaching out and calling, you know, saying, call my name. And so the fact that mm -hmm. you're able to put names to things um, and at least put who was there, because if we can't prove an exact grave, but we can definitely prove who was there, who else was there and what connections might be there. So there's even a bigger story, even if there's not a headstone designating. And I think Tom alluded to that. We know the three plantation owners and the enslaved and the work that Sam Tyler had done. We've got names. Same thing with Anson. We got names. They got names at, at the Clemson. And, and that's really what it's about. So I do want to thank everyone. I didn't see any other questions? Um, great discussion. We got some good feedback on here. And again, um, this YouTube video will go up later. Um, and I do want to say the next webinar is Saturday, November the 18th. We will have Angela Walton Raji on. And she'll be talking about, <laughs> excuse me, Oklahoma Freedmen of the Five Civilized Tribes with the new release of her book. She's one of your leading experts in the country that talks about the freedmen of those five civilized tribes that will still be at 1 p.m. Eastern time. And I am going to stop the recording unless you have any last words you would like to share. And Grant, I'll throw it to you first. Any last thing you wanna share with the audience? No, not really. Um, if they have questions, I'm available at the International African American Museum. Absolutely. My address is gmissue at iaamuseum.org. I appreciate that I was involved in the discussion with these other panelists. Um, and that's it for me. Okay, Tom Chapman. No, I'll, I'll say the same thing. If you're in the Charlottesville, Albemarle area, and uh, if we can assist you through the Historical Society in any way with a, a research question or a cemetery question, um, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. It's albemarlehistory.org, which is our website, and you can find all our emails and phone numbers there. And, um, you know, just one small thing that kind of shows this connection, you know, from that 1804 document, we had a, a young woman on that document. 
that we were then able to connect to 1952 uh, with some other work that other researchers had done to put a, a black uh, funeral home online. Mm. And Sam said, well, I think we got it here. We know we can get it to the 1950s. And that gentleman's name was John Gilmer Waller. And uh, Jeff Werner said, I know a Waller. I worked with a Waller in the planning department here, connected with them. And it was his great grandfather. And mm. that <laughs> particular side of the family on on Mr. Waller's side, the rest of the family, the Ivies, the Wormleys, you know, they all kind of understood their descent, um, their ancestry. Um, but Mr. Waller had never really told anyone about it. So mm. through this process, we were able to open up a whole new chain, a whole new link to their family mm. history. Wow. Uh, and yes, I want to reiterate what Diane was saying. A lot of what we were doing was from scratch, but there are so many threads and, and you are, you know, Shelly, you are adding to it in terms of what you're doing with the descendants group there at UVA. There's there's resources. There's a there's the opportunity to find this. And it's just a matter of kind of pulling on the right thread and having it just kind of unravel and, and finding that ancestor. So, but thank you very much for this opportunity, Shelly. I really appreciate it. Appreciate it. And thank you. And, and you think about the entities that are involved here. We got a museum, mm -hmm. we got a historical society, we got a filmmaker, we got a descendant and a university. Mm -hmm. And it just all comes together. There, there's part of the plan right there, <laughs> Lorenzo. <laughs> um, I would just say um, you can go to moppintown.com. That's M-A-U-P-I-N-T-O-W-N. Um, you can watch some of the films there and learn some more of the history. Um, other than that, just you know, keep keep telling these stories. Keep telling the stories. Dr. Thomas. Oh uh, yeah, I am. Um... I comes in as in the process of deciding what the permanent cemetery office will look like um, because, you know, we are committed to uh, preserving the cemeteries and, um, you know, developing and implementing a preservation plan. So um, because we are a public university in South Carolina, we share knowledge, um, we share resources. So please check out our website. Um, I only scratched the surface of all the wonderful research and community engagement our team has been doing. That's clemson.edu backslash cemetery, clemson.edu backslash cemetery. Um, contact information, we're on Twitter, Instagram, uh, Facebook. You can follow us, uh, follow our progress, see the stories that we're telling. Uh, but we're here to help and uh, reach out if you want to talk, um, we also have a symposium every October for two days. So please come and talk to us and with us and share information about your projects and network with people from all over the country who are doing similar work. And Diane, welcome back. We did share your comment that you text me with. And right Thank now you. we're just saying, what, what would you like people to take away? We talked a little bit about preservation education and awareness and working in the community do you have one thing you would like as a descendant and being involved in this over the last few years one thing you would like to share with the audience as a takeaway i would like for us to remain aware and stay connected with mm -hmm. our urban um or environmental protection plans and um what municipalities are doing, uh, the comprehensive planning uh, guidelines and things like that. Penn Park is a regional park, which means that we can have formal gatherings. Um, it's 50 acres or more, and you can have large complexes built. Um, you um, are different than urban or community uh, cemeteries or um, facilities. So just stay close to about those plans and knowing what's going on. Um, and uh, it's very important. There are environmental implications for where the future is going with preservation, where we're talking about um, conservation and environmental justice. And um, I think that those things are going to be important to stay abreast of that. 
And with climate change, just know what's going on and making sure that we, in, like I'm sure you've talked about engaging young pe people, yeah. uh, find out why, um, why, why, why it's important to care. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if you're able to play the video or not, but those are the things we I could. talk about. You couldn't. Yeah. yeah, it's probably, I now have a new upgrade of Zoom. That's what I was, <laughs> <laughs> that's what I was. Well, doing. one thing that people that can save the chat, and I shared how to save the chat, mm -hmm. that the link that you posted is still there and maybe they're able to pull it up. Mm -hmm. I also, based on a question I saw in the chat, I also put uh, lynnrainville.org's website yes. link in the chat. And she has a host of information on her website, but also she had a book, even though it was talking about um, Central Virginia cemeteries, within this book that she wrote, um, gives details about plantings, markers, and all different aspects, not just to Virginia, but in African American cemeteries. So it's a worthwhile book. And again, uh, I put her link to her website in the chat. And what comes up <laughs> is that it's in maintenance mode. So again, you'll have it for future, or you can Google for her book on the hidden cemeteries in Central Virginia. Mm -hmm. So again, thank you all for sharing your afternoon yeah. with the Center for <laughs> Family History at the International African American Museum and hope to see all of you back November the 18th at one o'clock Eastern Standard Time.